Thank you all for joining us today as we mark seven years since the self-proclaimed Islamic State committed genocide and crimes against humanity against the Yazidi community. Today, we recognize the urgent need for justice as most perpetrators have still not been held accountable for their crimes. Before we begin, a few housekeeping notes. We ask your forgiveness if there are technical difficulties. Please use the question and answer function located at the bottom center of your screen to type in your questions at any time throughout the program to reach the moderator. They will not appear on the main screen and the chat function is disabled. We will get to as many questions as possible in our allotted time. Closed captions are available during our program today and you can turn them on by clicking CC, the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide has monitored the risks of atrocities in Iraq for many years. In 2014, as the self-proclaimed Islamic State advanced into Sinjar, the homeland to the majority of the world Yazidi community, we were among the first to be on the ground documenting and analyzing the almost unimaginable horrible horrors that Daesh was perpetrating against women, men, and children of this marginalized and often misunderstood religious minority. Today, as we mark the anniversary of the attacks in Kocho, where 1,200 Yazidi were held hostage for two weeks, over 400 men were killed, hundreds of women and girls were taken and enslaved, young boys were forcibly conscripted. We recall that I think often of the few men that I spoke with who survived, of one man in particular who shared with me the names of over 105 family members who were missing. Tragically, seven years later, we still don't know the fate of many of those people. Others spoke of lying in mass graves after being shot and hearing US military planes overhead striking Mount Sinjar and ISIS fighters that were trying to go up the mountain to target Yazidi who were seeking refuge there. More than one man told me that as they were lying there, they thought that they and their loved ones were going to be saved. They weren't. Seven years have elapsed since Daesh's attack on the Yazidi of Sinjar, and it has been almost four years since the collapse of Daesh's control of territory in Iraq. Justice has not come fast enough, particularly for survivors, many of whom still live in tented camps with the fate and whereabouts of family and friends still unknown. Nevertheless, there are undeniable signs of progress. The first sign of progress, apologies. The first sign of progress is increasingly intense recognition of Daesh's genocide against the Yazidis. In November, 2015, the museum's Simon Scott Center published a bearing witness report called Our Generation is Gone the Islamic State's targeting of Iraqi minorities in Nineveh, which examined ISIS's attack on various ethno-religious minority communities, including the Christian, Kakai, Shabak, and Shia Turkmen communities. It has perhaps become best known for its finding that ISIS had committed genocide crimes against humanity and war crimes against the Yazidis of the Sinjar region. This report was followed by the June 2016 report by the UN Commission of Inquiry on Syria, which reached the same conclusion after their own independent investigations and analysis. The second sign of progress is the establishment of a UN entity charged specifically with supporting efforts to prosecute genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes perpetrated by Daesh. In 2017, in response to continuing pressure to ensure accountability for Daesh crimes, the United Nations Security Council established the UN investigative team to promote accountability for crimes committed by Daesh better known as UNITAD. In May 2021, after a multi-year investigation, then Special Advisor Kareem Khan presented his team's findings to the Security Council, stating that, based on independent and impartial investigations and in compliance with international standards and UN best practice, UNITAD has determined that there is a clear and convincing evidence that crimes against the Yazidi people constitute genocide more particularly, we have identified specific perpetrators who hold responsibility for the crime of genocide against the Yazidis. The third sign of progress has been the skill and expertise that have taken root in Yazidi-run organizations who, since 2014, have been at the forefront 
of supporting their own community and documenting the atrocities. Much of the work to done, done to achieve justice and accountability has been done by local organizations laboring on the ground in very challenging circumstances. And fourth, we're seeing the first sparks of criminal accountability with cases being prosecuted in German courts. In Iraq, a broader understanding of justice has taken root with the passage of the Yazidi Female Survivors Law, which provides assistance for psychological and medical care, housing and land compensation, livelihood measures for Yazidi, Christian and Turkmen women, and support for some commemoration and memorialization activities. However, while there is some progress, much more remains to be done. Survivors have the right to justice and the right has not yet been realized. On the seventh anniversary of the attacks on the Yazidis in Sinjar, we take a critical look at the progress towards justice and ask where do we stand on the path towards justice? And what are the hopes and expectations for justice and accountability in the near future? To begin this conversation, I'd like to introduce our first panelist today, Jonathan Agar, who is the legal officer in the Office of the Special Advisor at the United Nations Investigative Team to promote accountability for the crimes committed by Daesh, UNITED. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. In May of this year, UNITAD stated that it has clear and convincing evidence that ISIL committed genocide against the Yazidis. Today marks seven years since ISIL attacked the Yazidi village of Kocho in southern Sinjar, which saw all of its residents either killed or enslaved. Can you talk us through how UNITAD went about investigating the crimes that were committed in Kocho and in making its genocide determination? Thanks so much, Tommy. Absolutely. And um, thank you, first, for the, the Holocaust Memorial Museum for organizing this event. Uh, and thank you also to our, our partners and friends um, from the Astro and Free Yazidi Foundation for joining us today. I mean, I think the first thing to say is that, um, you know, in the way that we're conducting our work is, is working with, with the partners that we have with us today and, and, and watching the event. Uh, working with um, non-governmental organizations who, as you say and highlighted, including the Holocaust Memorial Museum, um, were there on the ground um, uh, before UNITAD. Uh, and so we partner with them and build on the work uh, already conducted by those entities. So I want to you know, thank you uh, for, for your work and those of the uh, other panelists and uh, their organizations. Um, uh, we've been working with the Yazidi community now for three years on the ground, as you say, since the start of our work in, in late 2018. Um, the investigations of the crimes against the Yazidi community in Sinjar has been really the, the first initial investigative priority of the team uh, since we arrived uh, in Iraq. Um, and, um, you know, working with national authorities, looking to see how to move forward from uh, investigations to prosecutions. And um, there's a number of key challenges that those national authorities highlight. And specifically when you're looking at prosecuting, not for, not for terrorism offenses, but for the crimes as they were, um, which is uh, crimes against humanity and genocide, um, pose particular challenges for those authorities trying to um, establish um, a solid evidentiary basis for those prosecutions. Those challenges include uh, access to crime scenes, uh, collecting forensic evidence that could be used uh, to corrobor corroborate testimonial evidence, uh, empowering and encouraging those who are most impacted by those crimes, the most vulnerable survivors, those who suffer from sexual gender-based violence, for example, to come forward with their accounts, uh, and also um, exploiting the massive, massive trove of evidentiary material that was created by ISIL itself through their digital evidence. And then they never considered they, they would have um, their uh, laptops um, and the records of their crimes uh, made available to national authorities and we're working now closely to exploit that evidence. Um, so I think mirroring your comment, Naomi, I think we're also um, looking at, albeit a very belated, but now slightly more positive outlook in terms of the accountability picture. And um, that's because we're now working to be able to build those bridges. Uh, for example, collecting uh, evidence from mass, mass grave sites in Iraq. We've ex excavated now 24 mass grave sites in total in cooperation with Yazda and Free Zidi Foundation uh, and others. And um, the digital evidence we're now exploiting significantly. Um, we've received over 24 terabytes of such data just the, from the beginning of this year. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit later some more detail as to the, the progress we've made in that regard. Um, what I'd like to hopefully show to you today is actually a bit of a visual landscape uh, of how we're doing that. You know, one of the key questions always is moving the, the crime scene to the courtroom, how do we do that? Uh, and what we're trying to do through our digital evidence presentation platform is be able to actually take judges, take prosecutors back to these crime scenes. Um, and so uh, if our colleagues might be able to uh, bring this up on the screen, I'll talk through a little bit how we've done this uh, in cooperation with our, with our colleagues. 
So as I say, our key investigative priority began uh, with the Yazidi community in Sinjar. Um, to create a kind of visual context, we've collected satellite imagery from national authorities, also working with our colleagues at UNISAT uh, to create a full kind of mapping of key crime areas, um, then developing uh, that picture with uh, laser uh, uh, drone footage collected at crime scenes. Here you see Kojo village itself as collected from our forensics officers, uh, and then allied with that actual 3D laser scans within Kojo village itself. So as we see those spots on the screen there, we move into a full uh, reconstruction of Kojo village as collected by our forensic officers on the ground. Uh, and we move to Kojo school, where, as you know, on August the 15th, um, the mass majority of the village were taken by ISIL. We move into the school using our 3D scan uh, and we're uh, met by one of our key witnesses explaining how men and women were brought into the school women taken upstairs and men taken downstairs into the corridors, as you see here. Um, engaging with witnesses has been a huge priority for UNITAD. We've collected thousands of witness statements, either independently or also from our colleagues at Free Zidi Foundation and other NGOs. Um, if I could just pause here for one moment, um, we uh, see here um, a, um, a statement by uh, one of the witnesses stating that Daesh members came to us and told us to hand over our belongings, our gold, money and phones. And um, so here's a good example of where we've been able to take that testimonial evidence and then corroborate it with additional evidence. Um, and this, in this case, if we can move forward, um, call data records of the villagers um, collected by the team. Uh, this was collected by cooperation with the Iraqi judiciary uh, and with Iraqi telecommunications providers, which actually show us the activity of uh, villagers within the uh, within Kojo village and their calls going out from August the 8th through all the way until August the 15th. As you see, at the moment we arrive on August the 15th, all call data records stop. Uh, at the moment, the phones are confiscated by ISIL. Um, we've also been able to um, secure an agreement from Iraqi telecommunications providers that they will freeze all data from around the time of occupation of ISIL so that we come back and make specific requests moving forward. Uh, moving out through in, back into the school, uh, our witness describes the uh, movement of uh, female um, members of the village to the higher levels of the school with ISIL members guarding both sides of the staircase. Um, you'll see now um, some testimony placed on the screens from specific female survivors. We've placed the camera in this exact location that those survivors have described themselves as being located and overhearing ISIL discussing with the Mukta of the village uh, the potential forced conversion of the members of the village. And uh, you'll see that the Mukta uh, refused to do so and as a result, of course, was later executed. Engaging with these survivors <clears throat> in particular, the female survivors, has been a significant challenge for UNITAD, but also I think uh, an area where we've added significant additional value. Uh, we established a specific unit, a uh, gender crimes unit, a female only unit. Uh, if we could also pause here for a moment. Um, a female only unit um, to engage with these um, survivors uh, and also have four specific um, psychosocial experts who have assisted um, such uh, survivors to come forward with their accounts in a way that uh, seeks to reduce re-traumatization. Um, but not only that, to actually empower individuals to, for the first time, um, share their experiences again in a way um, that reduces trauma. Um, as we move out through the school, we travel to the um, mass grave sites, the 17 mass grave sites in Kojo, uh, we can move forward. Um, and um, UNITAD has worked closely um, with um, non-governmental organizations, with Iraqi authorities and with KRG authorities to excavate all 17 mass grave sites um, within Kojo village. Um, as I'll mention later on, we've also now facilitated the return of remains. You see each site here located uh, within Kojo village as identified uh, by UNITAD in cooperation with uh, relevant national, national authorities. I think a key point here, and again, going back to the turn of added value of bringing the international community into these investigations, is turning the approach from one of purely identification of remains, identification of persons, to actually treating it as a crime scene. How do you secure evidence in terms of the chain of custody of material, in terms of the method of collection? Uh, and you see here some of the excavations ongoing um, as supported by UNITAD. And then also, of course, the storage of material in a way that preserves the evidentiary value um, as we move forward. In addition to forensic material, uh, we've worked closely with Iraqi judiciary to digitize existing Iraqi um, 
uh, case files, but also, as you see here, extract ISIL rosters uh, from their own digital devices. So this is an actual internal ISIL uh, fighter roster. Uh, and the entry highlighted is in relation to an individual called Abu Hamza. Abu Hamza was uh, one of the lead uh, individuals believed to have been involved in the Kojo massacre. Uh, and we see multiple entries in this roster detailing payments made to him by ISIL, detailing the number of um, sexual slaves taken, taken by him. Uh, and so through this type of evidentiary material, we can tie specific persons to locations, to crime scenes, to um, uh, particular activities, including the purchase um, of um, Yazidi female uh, members of the community. Um, the depth uh, and the breadth of crimes committed against the Yazidi community are obviously so profound that a holistic approach is required in relation to how we engage with this. Um, so in addition to our kind of core investigative activities, we've worked closely with Free Yazidi Foundation, Yazda, uh, and others um, to assist in the return of remains uh, to Kojo. And you see here the footage from the actual ceremony itself where we returned the remains of over 100 individuals um, excavated from the mass grave sites you saw earlier. Um, this process continues, and not just in Kojo, of course, um, at Solar Institute also, uh, a similar process is now being commenced. And of course, not just in relation to the Yazidi community, but in relation to all communities impacted by ISIL. Um, that's the end of the, 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 the digital part uh, of the presentation, just to really kind of take a step back uh, from that kind of dive into the visual presentation of our evidence. Um, you know, I think the question you ask then is, well, what, what is that for? I mean, it's not sufficient for us to, to merely um, collect that information and create an, a historical archive, as important as that is, um, to be able to reflect and remember um, the acts that took place. Really, we want to do something with this this, this information. Um, and um, I think also there, the outlook is, is, is more positive. Um, as I say, we've engaged now with 14 different national authorities from different member states seeking to take forward prosecutions in relation to ISIL crimes. Um, I do see, as one of the individuals who's liaising with those authorities, um, a kind of coalition, if you like, of accountability starting to develop, particularly amongst EU national authorities, and particularly particularly looking through the prism of international crimes. Um, so, uh, as you mentioned, Germany has been taking action, but there's also a number of different national jurisdictions uh, looking at it both from terrorism perspective, but also adding now this prism of war crimes and genocide. And we hope that our finding uh, in May, uh, we have a um, uh, over 500 page uh, case brief, which is now being made available to national authorities, detailing the constituent elements of the crimes against the Yazidi, why that, why that constitutes genocide, which we hope can assist national authorities also in a mindset change of not thinking that it's something impossible to achieve, but something now we have the evidence to actually prosecute. Um, so uh, that's really just a, a kind of a stock take of where we are. I think a more positive note than we may have struck a couple of years ago. Um, nevertheless, recognizing that it is already too late uh, and, 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 and people have been waiting too long for this. So we'll continue to work with urgency with, with all of our colleagues. So thank you so much. And, and I'm available for any questions afterwards. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for that. Um, really remarkable just to see, see the, the scope of the work that's been done. And as you said, the advances that have been made in the last seven years, recognizing that, of course, uh, there's still a long road ahead, but really also a lot of learning and innovation that will be useful in future cases. And I, I, I say that also kind of mindful today of what's happening in Afghanistan uh, and a lot of work by Afghani organizations to try to get victim statements, evidence out of the country um, and it, I think that that kind of is a, a good segue right into talking about the work of Yazidi organizations on the ground and how it's complemented the efforts of uh, international organizations. And many of your efforts have been very much reliant on the work of Yazidi organizations. Um, in that regard, I wanted to turn to two representatives of uh, those organizations, Pari Ibrahim of the Free Yazidi Foundation and Natya Nabruz, the Legal Advocacy Director at Yazda. Pari, if I may start with you, much that we know of the ISIL attacks thus far has been focused on villages in southern Sinjar. FYF has been documenting uh, what occurred in north Sinjar, focusing primarily on Hardan. Can you speak to us a little bit about how FYF approaches documentation, especially right now during COVID, uh, and what has struck you about the stories coming from northern Sinjar? Thank you, Naomi, and thank you to the Holocaust uh, Museum. Um, first, I want to say, since it's 
uh, two days ago that it's been uh, the seven year commemoration of the Kocho massacre. Uh, I want to underscore the solidarity with the survivors from Kocho and also especially the women and girls that I know personally and have grown to know over the last seven years. Um, some of them are very private people and you will not hear from them in public forum. Uh, but I know all EZD organizations uh, and international community are trying to do their best to support uh, these women and girls. And I know that this video will eventually reach them as well. So for them to know that they are not forgotten and that we're still fighting to get justice. Um, at the same time, like we must uh, also conduct uh, analysis of the crimes uh, that were perpetrated in other parts of uh, Sinjar, so not only in Kocho. And so today is a great way to uh, uh, relay that. Um, underreported areas like in the north of Sinjar, uh, for example, the one that the Free City Foundation did, Hardan. Um, I visited empty road, uh, roads and fields of Hardan with some journalists in 2016. And the bones of the Yazidi community, they were uh, lying in the field, uh, on the ground. Uh, uh, there were sticks with tapes around them, uh, like you might see in uh, potholes in New York City. You know, uh, so uh, you could understand by looking at the location, how the Yazidis were trying to escape and uh, where they were killed. Uh, some were in mass graves, uh, but in other cases, uh, there were just bones of individuals lying on the ground. And uh, this is a situation all around Sinjar and many of the mass graves remain that way many years later, seven years later. Um, but despite of the many hurdles uh, during COVID, uh, our organization undertook structural crime scene analysis of Hardan massacre in 2020. Uh, and first thing to say is that FIF is a Yazidi women uh, run organization and gender equity and women's rights uh, is as important to me as anything else. And I have my own reasons for that. Uh, so we went, when we work with survivors, uh, and especially Yazidi women in particular, we make sure that this is not an exercise to extract information. The purpose of this is to inform the women of their rights of how the justice system works and what is and what cannot uh, be done and what is being done. And uh, the truth is that many of the survivors will never get justice because some of the perpetrators are already dead in Syria and in Iraq and the justice system moves very slowly and often uh, ineffectively. So we have international lawyers who work with survivors and adhere to the informed consent and the survivor centric, uh, centered uh, engagement. Um, by now, uh, interviewing more than two dozen witnesses, we've been able to put together uh, an understanding of what happened in this village of uh, in Sinjar in Hardan. Uh, this happened in uh, 2 and 3 August. Um, there's not a great deal of open source information about the horrific mass atrocities, but to a significant degree of accuracy, we can now understand just like what Jonathan just showed us, uh, what happened, where were they, and uh, details about who the perpetrators were. So the Hardan massacre was one of the largest and worst in the Yazidi genocide, but it has been largely reported, uh, has not been largely reported or analyzed. And I should note that uh, 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 Jonathan also already said, so we undertook this effort to investigate Hardan in close coordination with UNITED so that we avoid any duplication because we have really serious concerns uh, when we're talking about duplication. First, because Yazidi survivors uh, have experienced unnecessary re-traumatization from journalists, lawyers, NGO workers, and others. And so we must try to avoid that at all costs. It's not necessary. And secondly, there are limited resources in the field. And so we must ensure that we are not wasting time or energy uh, or funding uh, and duplicating people's work. So for that reason, FIF has worked closely with UNED to understand which geographical areas uh, are already well covered and which ones need more legal analysis. So aside from the underlying information from witnesses, including uh, female Yazidi survivors, our legal team will soon complete an overarching uh, analytic document about the Hardan massacre to be shared with UN mechanisms and prosecutors in Europe and elsewhere. I think it's very necessary because this is a way we can end impunity for others around the world to understand 
what specifically happened because i think a lot of people know like okay there was a genocide against the yazidi community in sinjar but what exactly really happened there what crimes were committed so like most of you already know, there's been a lot of sens uh, sensationalism uh, coverage of the Yazidi genocide and especially the plight of the Yazidi woman. And so the tension has been a double-edged sword that uh, sometimes uh, crossed the line to exploitation and uh, sort of international entertainment, which is very sad to see. At the same time, many survivors and their families did not benefit from this at all. And they ask us, like, why no one seems to care about, uh, for example, Hardan, uh, one of the villages that's been forgotten. Um, and there are many other specific locations like Hardan. Uh, it's very important for all actors in the justice space to work steadily, calmly, and professionally to develop a, uh, a much uh, as much evidence and information as possible. And we know that many of the perpetrators of the crimes against the Yazidi community are dead, but not all of them. So there must be consistent pressure that perpetrators will one day face justice and we need to end impunity. Finally, I want to mention two distinct points briefly in relation to this. Like the first is the psychological and physical and emotional um, and family impact of gender-based crimes uh, and crimes of sexual violence. Recovery of, uh, from all of these crimes is very difficult, but many of our uh, beneficiaries who have returned from captivity, uh, you, you know, they're like, um, just an example, like The Walking Dead. I remember specifically working with one Yazidi woman who was from Kocho and trying to make sure that, um, and, and create the argument that it is possible to eventually love life again. So as I sat with her in her new home, it was an unfinished concrete building. Um, and at that time we were fortunate enough, we had a great women's center with two British psychologists who were working there at the time every day. Um, so they worked with her and a year later, she was still sorrowful and still suffering, but she could finally start to live life. She went outdoors, she started making friends. She now has moved to Germany, but the pain and the weight of gender-based crimes is so awful, so deep and so grave. So we must remember that all survivors of sexual violence, uh, not only from ISIS, but survivors everywhere around the world, they carry an invisible burden that can make life dark and unbearable if they do not receive the right support. And believe me, seven years later, we are still working with our community to just make that right, you know, try to get them back to start to love life again. The second part is related to, uh, to this, that I and the Yazidi community, we're very concerned about the impunity. Uh, tens of thousands of ISIS members, they remain in Syria, they remain in Iraq. And uh, I think what they've learned is that justice is not strong enough to contain them. They are the ones who inflict the pain and the suffering that I just described. And they are not remorseful. They would commit the same crimes again and again. Although they might fear the airstrikes and the battle, I do not believe they have any fear about the justice and accountability aspect. Um, so with the high number of uh, perpetrators that there are, uh, it is really an open question as to what a tribunal or the International Criminal Court or other sort of arrangements really could do. In the end, it will be for local justice systems to deal with this enormous number of perpetrators. I'm sure others uh, uh, will discuss this, but this is a serious concern. The world must not allow perpetrators to commit genocide, mass rape, and actual slave trade in the 21st century and just get away with that. Just like stand still and think of that. 21st century slave trade, is that acceptable? Can you buy people on an actual market? Do we just allow that? And to remember, as we mark seven years of the Kocho massacre, a lot of the girls from Kocho that were kidnapped 2,868 women and girls are still missing. We need to search for them. Thank you so much, Rapari, uh, for that. There's so much to unpack, and I just want to remind everyone to please send your questions uh, for, for the panelists. And just picking up on that last point, Pari, to kind of remind everyone that the genocide is ongoing insofar as these women are still being held um, in keeping with the genocidal intent that the self-proclaimed Islamic State had advanced. And I really appreciate the points that you made around the ethical dimensions of documentation and of the pursuit of justice and accountability. It is incredibly sobering to think 
that many of the men, women have been interviewed multiple times, many times not in keeping with kind of international standards so that their, their accounts can be used for future prosecution, many not taken in a, a manner that is um, reflective of best standards to not re-traumatize people. And as you noted, uh, I think this question of what happened to the Yazidi, but also now today when we look at the Rohingya community, really begs uh, a larger conversation around the ethics that, that come into even reporting and journalists' uh, um, involvement, because I think many of us who've been working in, in both contexts have had the tragic experience where you walk into a camp and someone comes up and says, oh, you must be here to talk to my sister, who's a survivor of rape. Um, and you can look and see the number of journalists who have come in and are asking very pointed, specific questions. Your comments also remind us that the commission of genocide in the context of the Yazidi, it, every constitutive act within the genocide convention was met. This was a genocide perpetrated against the entirety of the community. And we often forget at times the needs of men and boys um, who have been severely traumatized uh, in this entire process and continue to need kind of specific assistance. Um, I wanted to turn to Natya at this particular point. When we, we talk about justice, we're talking about more than just criminal accountability. And I know that you and Yazda have been involved in really challenging work, uh, engaging the Iraqi parliament and trying to mobilize the political will to pass the Yazidi female survivors law. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that law. What is it directed towards? And given your work with survivors, can you give us a perspective of what their view is of the progress that has been made uh, and what they're hoping for in the next year or two as well? Thank you, Naomi. And uh, I also would like to thank the US Holocaust Memorial Museum for inviting me to this important webinar. It's an honor uh, to be speaking alongside experts such as Patty and Jonathan. So I, I will start by saying a few words about the adoption of the Yazidi female survivors law and the current legislative process, because it's, it's very important to understand. And then I will present the progress survivors are hoping to see in the next year. So the Yazidi female survivors law was signed by the Iraqi president in March 2019 and civil society organizations as well as survivors found out about it through scattered and incomplete media posts. We quickly came to understand, uh, however, the, the significance of the law, and um, we understood that it was the first time in Yazidi history and in Iraqi history that a law was presented to provide a comprehensive program of reparations to victims with provisions on monthly compensation, access to education and employment, a plot of land, and rehabilitation services. So in that sense, the, the draft was truly groundbreaking. So from early on, you could see that, you know, we had mixed feelings coming from civil society organizations and survivors. On one hand, we were very supportive of the initiative, but on the other hand, we were very disappointed by the lack of consultations. The later could, however, be fixed since the law, the law was only a draft in March 2019 and needed to go through the parliamentary and process in Baghdad. So Yazda and, uh, has an established re record of working directly with survivors on matters related to them. Therefore, it was out of the question for us to provide our insight on the law without consulting survivors first. We therefore brought together a group of 15 active and brave Yazidi survivors and with the support of IOM, we organized for them a training on transitional justice and more specifically on reparation. From these women, from these 15 women, uh, only two had vaguely heard about the Yazidi survivors law, but all of them were, de were determined to be part of the process and in their own words, to ask for their rights. After this phase of, of capacity building, uh, these same survivors attended meetings in Erbil with policymakers from Baghdad. The aim was for the survivors to present their recommendations on how this law should be improved. I was there and, and I remember seeing lawmakers crying when listening to the survivors. For a lot of them, it was actually the first time that they were even meeting survivors. I was also struck by the fact that even though these survivors were present in this meeting to ask lawmakers for their own rights, they were also asking for the rights of others. 
they ask that Yazidi men and boys uh, are included in the law. They ask that survivors from other groups, such as Christian, Turkmen, and Shabaks, are included in the law. So in, in parallel of this work with the survivors on, on the Yazidi survivors law, we were also involved uh, in, in work with NGOs and we joined the Coalition for Just Reparation, um, which Free Yazidi Foundation is also a part of. It's a, it's a coalition of 32 Iraqi NGOs working with different communities in different areas of Iraq and advocating for the rights to reparation of ISIL survivors. So with the coalition, we worked tirelessly to present to the legal committee of the Iraqi parliament our recommendations to improve the Yazidi survivors law. And we also produced a draft law on its own on reparations for survivors of conflict related sexual violence committed by all parties in Iraq. So after several readings of, of the law in the Iraqi parliament, the law was finally adopted two years later. So in March of this year, it was not perfect. It did not or, in, or incorporate all of our recommendations, but it was there and it was workable. So I want to just stop you for a second and really uh, highlight and commend the efforts of survivors and civil society organizations for making this law what it is today. However, uh, the work is not over. Uh, our efforts need to continue and they actually really need to intensify. Now that the law was adopted, we need to ensure that it is actually implemented. Without implementation, the law will be just an empty promise made to survivors. And to enable this implementation, implementing regulations need to be adopted by the Iraqi Council of Ministers. The law says that from the day of its adoption, the council has 90 days for so three months to e issue these regulations. As I just said, the law was adopted in March of this year. So the council had until June to present these bylaws. We are now in, in the middle of, of August, so six months later, and the bylaws are still not finalized. And to make it very clear to the audience, without these bylaws, the implementation of the Yazidi survivors law is not possible. So in order to accelerate that process, we worked again with the coalition to submit recommendations on how these bylaws should look like. We highlighted the need for survivor-centered approach in the implementation phase. And we asked this concept, so survivor-centered approach to be explicitly mentioned in the bylaws. Unfortunately, we were, we were ignored and almost none of our recommendations were followed this time, this time for the bylaws. So Yazda and the coalition therefore believe currently that the bylaws in the current form do not provide sufficient basis for an effective and survivor-centered reparation scheme. It is therefore for the utmost importance that the Iraqi Council of Ministers revises the bylaws and adopts them as soon as possible. And they're already uh, three months behind. Um, I, I will now take a couple of minutes just to address the second part uh, of, of your question, Naomi, which was what survivors hope to see in the next year uh, in relation to this law. So, of course, and, and this will not come as a surprise, survivors want action. Um, and, and a lot of things can actually be done in the next year. First, survivors want to be and need to be continuously informed about the progress that is done in implementing the law. A lot of this information is already circulating and need to be clarified. Uh, as Yazda, and I'm sure it's the case for many other NGOs, we receive a lot of phone calls. And actually, you know, the only thing we can say is that the bylaws are still not adopted. So nothing really started yet. And in, in uh, March of this year, we also published a report on another reparation measure, which is the survivor grant scheme. And this survivor's grant scheme was a one-time payment of 2 million Iraqi dinners. So it was around $1,700 at that time that was provided to Yazidi survivors by the Ministry of Migration and Displacement. Um, and Displacement. So again, this, this step from the, from the ministry was very commendable, but the process of obtaining this pay, payment was very unclear. The eligibility criteria was very uh, unclear. Some survivors received it and other survivors from the same family did not. And all these unclarities created a lot of frustration in the Yazidi community. One survivor told us in the report 
no one told me anything or I would have applied. So to, to avoid these past mistakes and to avoid re-traumatization, because this, this frustration is, is creating re-traumatization, a clear outreach system for the Yazidi survivors law needs to, needs to be put in place in the next months. Second, the Iraqi government needs to provide resources to the Directorate for Survivors Affairs. So the Directors of the Survivors Affairs is the, is the entity that will receive the claims of, of survivors. And Ms. Sarab Elias Yazidi was appointed as the head of the Directorate, but she has currently no financial and human resources to move any process uh, forward. Yesterday, uh, the main office of the directorate was opened in Mosul and we command the step. But again, currently, you know, they don't have any staff, they don't have any budget. So it will be very hard for them to, to start any tangible work. So just to summarize, uh, once the bylaws are adopted, once the directorate is fully operating and survivors are aware of the application pro process, submit their claims and receive an answer, only then they will be able to, to start to receive any benefits and services that the law is promising. So as I said, the law is, is a very good first step, but a, a lot still needs to be done. And we need to act quickly to avoid that those survivors wait another seven years to receive long awaited relief. Iraq, the international community and NGOs need to continue working together to make all of this happen but we also need to work together to manage expectations of survivors that are currently very, very high. As I conclude, I would also like to highlight that the Yazidi Survivors Law is a good step to address some of the sufferings of ISIL survivors, but it is far from enough. Uh, Iraq needs to have a broader and holistic approach in terms of transitional justice mechanism. For instance, and just to go back to, to the Yazidi survivors law, how will survivors enjoy benefits of the law, such as receiving a piece of land, if they don't want to return to their homeland Sinjar, because, you know, Sinjar is still destroyed, uh, there is no security, there is no stable administration, and there are no services. The law also recognizes the Yazidi genocide and, and makes the 3rd of August the genocide commemoration day, but again, how can survivors take this seriously when seven years after the genocide, there is still no accountability in Iraq for ISIL crimes against Yazidis? So these are questions that need to be addressed by Iraq and the international community in consultations with the survivors themselves. And I really insist on that. Thank you. And uh, I'm available for any more questions. Thank you so much, Nadja, for that incredibly powerful uh, overview of what the process has been, um, and it sounds incredibly arduous. Uh, I think also just highlighting, you know, the importance that your organization, FYF, FYF, places on advocating for consultations with survivors. The reality that survivors have to have a seat at the table and also be at the fore of advancing these efforts is something that's often taken for granted. Uh, so I really appreciate your reiterating that. And also, as you and both Pari have said, we need to be thinking also about justice at the local level. What does that mean for cases uh, that need to be held in Iraq? Uh, we all know that many, many people, uh, many neighbors, for example, were involved in identifying who was Yazidi or not for ISIS, were complicit in the commission of crimes, uh, committed crimes themselves. And over and over again, we're told by survivors that what they want to see is the people they know held responsible. That's what they need in order to be able to feel safe in moving home. But we haven't seen a lot of movement at the national level. And that begs the question posed um, by Greg Stanton, who's long been working on issues related to, to genocide in this particular case. For all of the panelists, what are the obstacles that have prevented trials by Iraqi and Syrian courts to try alleged ISIS perpetrators. Maybe we can start um, with Pari, Natia, and then Jonathan, your perspective. Pari. Well, I think that uh, for Syria, the state is not functioning. It could be possible that the AANES, the autonomous, uh, autonomous administration of Northeast Syria to conduct trials, but it is not a state. Uh, I know there have been talks about that and they're still ongoing. Um, 
in Iraq, it's another uh, situation where everyone is being tried under terrorism laws, uh, not genocide because there's no genocide law. The actual crimes of the Yazidis uh, that were committed against the Yazidis are being lost because every ISIS member has a five minute or less trial uh, in court uh, for being in a terrorist group and that's all. So the crimes that were committed against the Yazidis, the rape, the genocide, the murders, the kidnappings, the enslavement, uh, all these things are not mentioned at all. So the genocide of the Yazidis in court in Iraq is just forgotten. Thank you for that, Pari. Nadia? Yes, uh, absolutely. And I just want to add that the, the other you know, big issue in Iraq, uh, as I said, it's there's no legal framework uh, to prosecute ISIL members for international crimes. And there was actually a very recent initiative from the Kurdistan region of Iraq, so in April this, this year, to set up an ISIL tribunal in Erbil. Uh, you know, and, and from our perspective, you know, this was really, again, better than, than nothing. So what we tried to do as, as Yazda, and we also involved survivors, is that, you know, we, we went to the, to the parliament in Iraq and we told them, look, uh, you ca we cannot stop you to move this process forward. But what we want is, you, is for you to consult survivors, is to consult NGOs and not commit the same mistakes as, you know, federal government uh, committed at the very beginning with the Yazidi survivors law. Unfortunately, uh, a couple of months later, so in June this year, the federal Supreme Court in Baghdad, you know, um, issued a decision and said that the, the KRI initiative was uh, unconstitutional. And, and, the, and the, this decision from the Supreme Court is final, cannot be appealed. So it completely stopped the KRI initiative. And what is unfortunate here is that Baghdad, you know, didn't really offer any alternatives. They just stopped the process, but without moving it forward themselves. Um, so, you know, what we are trying to do here now, and, and I think this, this whole discussion between Kara I, indirect discussion between Kara I and Baghdad created a momentum to really go back to survivors and ask them, you know, what is it that you want in terms of accountability and transitional justice mechanism? So this is what we will try to do in the coming months, you know, ask directly survivors. Thank you so much for that, um, Natia and Pari. I mean, it is incredibly frustrating to see um, how difficult it has been to mobilize at times the Iraqi government to, to actually enact laws and allow for the prosecution of the crime of genocide. Um, as you said, Pari, so that people are, are not um, avoiding accountability for committing these horrific crimes. Um, but also just as, as you were noting, Nadia, uh, how difficult it is to just actually even find points for engagement to sustain these conversations, despite the fact that the international community has been quite explicit in um, its uh, strong stance against ISIS. That really hasn't translated, though, into really pushing the Iraqi government hard to make accountability uh, at the core of its, its efforts. Um, Jonathan, you've had to sit at the intersection of, of working on behalf of the United Nations to engage uh, with the Iraqi um, officials and obviously Pari noted the challenges in Syria. Maybe you could share your perspective. Uh, you did note before that you're working with 14 other jurisdictions, I believe, on possible domestic cases um, outside of Iraq. So maybe we could actually have you comment both on engagement in Iraq, but also how if you can share a little bit more. You're working with the Germans and others to advance their efforts. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm really I'll just be building off, um, you know, the very you know, kind of comprehensive picture already outlined by Pari and Nati. I mean, I think um, I think that there's two, there's two there's two tracks to it. Right. I think one is a legislative basis and then one is actually building these cases together. And I think actually these tracks have to kind of work uh, in parallel. That's that, that's something that we've realized in the work we're doing. You can't kind of wait for the legislative basis to then start building the case because these cases these cases are, are going to be big cases i mean there's significant cases that we're talking about um prosecuting individuals for genocide uh, in terms of the transformative effect that accountability could have um i think the objective from the unitad side would ideally support you know prosecutions looking at international crimes against the Yazidi community against different other different communities and really have this accountability process address um the needs and the experiences of all communities in Iraq impacted. So there's no doubt that that has to work in parallel, the collection, the preservation, the preparing of these case briefs, and then actually putting it forward. I think I think the, the word, you know, Nati mentioned the momentum, I think is an important one. Um, uh, it's not a completely clear picture, I think, right now. Um, I think what the good thing is that there are initiatives, there are people 
there are you know important constituencies also you know within also even within you know the the, the, the government of Iraq side as well trying to move it forward but at least in the parliamentary side um, putting forward initiatives and there's been a recent additional initiative uh, for, on the Baghdad side for potential legislation um, and UNITAD is there you know we're in Iraq uh, c- collecting evidence specifically to support prosecutions for these crimes uh, and we are established with the primary intended recipient uh, per- pursuant to our terms of reference being the Iraqi authorities now you know we're not here because the Security Council thought it was a good idea. We've been invited, and I think you know there still has to be you know some credit given for that. That you know that that that, that we've been invited by the government of Iraq to do this to support them. So obviously it's for a purpose, and I think there's a recognition of that. Uh, and just going back to the Yazidi survivors' law as well, you know, there's recognition within that that there was a genocide that took place, but also that there will be prosecutions for those crimes. Uh, and so, um, as Natia mentioned, you know, the implementation of that should also then incorporate, um, hopefully, uh, an aspect in terms of the legislative basis for this. Um, just a couple of very quick uh, examples in terms of the parallel track process. Um, mm-hmm. We have a training program at the moment with Iraqi um, uh, high court judges uh, seeking to provide them training on international criminal law um, so that when uh, we are able to provide our evidence and develop within the case briefs, they have that themselves, that legal knowledge and the framework in terms of the constituent elements of genocide uh, and crimes against humanity. And so that course is coming up uh, uh, to be completed quite soon. Uh, We've had uh, Arabic only uh, trainers from around the world, from different uh, universities, leading experts providing that, and then also kind of engendering an interest and understanding as to why prosecutions of these types of crimes are important vis-a-vis terrorism offences, um, as outlined um, by Parry. Um, just very quickly, I guess, on the global framework, um, as I say, you know, our primary objective is to try and move forward on the, on the Iraq side. But of course, um, we want to make sure that we're delivering accountability wherever we can. There's no channel um, that shouldn't be exploited in this. And I think that's an overall point. There's no there's no silver bullet. You know, There's no tribunal, even if established, that will be able to handle all these cases, as Parry said. There has to be national authorities in European restrictions, national authorities in Iraq, uh, potentially in, in KRG, potentially, uh, you know, whether there's a tribunal ICC, that's, you know, way above my prey grade in terms of whether that ever happens, but UNITAD is developing the evidence so that we can put into prosecutions wherever they may be, wherever they may be found in consultation with the government of Iraq. So, um, yeah, Germany, I think, has been a leader on this. Um, they, they've taken forward a couple of cases, but um, We've also got um, you know, ongoing cooperation with states in North, Af- uh, North America, um, with um, Western European states, and also now actually interestingly with other states you know, emerging into the accountability field um, in terms of more Eastern European countries coming forward. So I think there is um, a kind of growing coalition, as I say, of national authorities who are also working together and starting to exchange information in terms of foreign terrorist fighters who may have been working together, uh, who are also heavily involved, of course, in the, um, in the, in the sexual slavery. So. Um, um, I think, you know, momentum is the key word and it's an important word. It needs to be kept up. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, we're there to support. We did do with the KRG law and with the Baghdad law. We provided some advice and support on that. Uh, and we're really there to support any colleagues in Iraq um, to move these things forward um, and keep the momentum going. You know, on the point of just um, finding innovative and creative new strategies, there's been a comment that's been made that um, I think is really timely, and that is uh, about strategies to go after those who made profits from uh, the commission of genocide um, or who were in complicit. So that includes, you know, I'm thinking about the cases that have been taken forward in regards to Lafarge, the cement company, um, where there are uh, charges that the the company made payments to ISIS uh, sensibly as some form of a tax uh, and in doing so uh, were benefiting financially from uh, terrorist activity but also complicit in the commission of crimes against humanity and it's a case that Yazidis organizations have um, been part of and want to to advance other strategies for for going after those who are profiting. Maybe Jonathan, I can just quickly ask you just to, to speak briefly about the specific unit that works on financial tracking Uh, if you can give some insights into that area. And then Hari and Nadia, I'd be curious if you could uh, share your thoughts on how your organizations have been engaging in these types of, of cases. Sure, thank, thanks so much, Debbie. Yeah, indeed, we have a, a dedicated financial tracking unit uh, in, in, in UNITAD, and what's been fascinating to me is um, the combination of the um, independent lines of investigation we have in terms of financing, um, and um, actually the quite readily available information in terms of specific transactions, uh, particularly in terms of coming out of um, uh, 
uh, money money transfer services. Um, you know, again, uh, in some senses, the kind of the, the arrogance of the sense of impunity uh, is an advantage uh, retrospectively for individuals who are actually not really necessarily doing a great deal to try and hide those types of transactions in terms of their own, own internal uh, uh, reg uh, records, but also in terms of the financial transactions. And I think key to this has been our partnerships um, with uh, private sectors as well, with financial institutions uh, who have been actually quite uh, forthcoming uh, to engage with the team. We've received significant amount of data from uh, major financial institutions and also with um, uh, national authorities um, to uh, seek to track this. Um, for me, uh, the very exciting point is when we see intersections between uh, our investigations on the ground, for example, uh, at Kojo or now as we are doing moving forward uh, to the northern Iraq and the actual uh, financial support provided to those specific battalions who were involved in those attacks. So uh, in the case of Kojo, we do have information now uh, seeking, I think, providing quite clear um, connections between the financial support provided by individuals um, to uh, those attacks. Um, and, um, you know, we're continuing to, to develop that. Um, uh, that's um, being supported by um, uh, uh, the government of Germany in terms of an extra budgetary contribution. Um, but we're seeking to expand that work in, in the near future. I think it's uh, essential. Um, you know, this, this was not done uh, through individual actors on the ground. Of course, there was a network of support, um, both within Iraq uh, and globally. And so um, we're actually this year, um, towards the back end of this year, we'll be issuing a publication uh, detailing um, some of our key findings in relation to the financial networks that had um, supported uh, ISIL. Thank you so much for that, uh, Jonathan. I wanted to um, ask Pari uh, a question. Um, you have been tracking, uh, along as Yazda, some of these cases uh, that are advancing, and Lafarge was, was one in particular that I mentioned. What uh, promise do you think there is for advancing uh, in this particular space? Thank you, Naomi. I mean, yes, the Free Yazidi Foundation a long time ago was in touch with uh, the organizations that basically created the case against the Lafarge. Uh, Lafarge, the biggest cement company in France. Uh, I mean, I, I think also around the world. Um, it is... Uh, it is really unbelievable to see that, uh, uh, yeah, with money you have power and you can do whatever you want. And then afterwards uh, that money ends up in hands of these terrorist organizations who are genocidal organizations, who are committing certain crimes. I'm definitely sure that like that money that eventually ended up in Syria, uh, ended up in the uh, buying of slaves as well. Uh, I'm sure of that because uh, where did all the money come from if it weren't from uh, international uh, ISIS fighters who came to the region uh, or uh, all, the, all the money that came from from, uh, financial supporters. Uh, we heard also from Qatar. Uh, I mean, it's highly important that uh, even these big financial companies, like these big uh, companies around the world who have financially attributed to these genocide organizations eventually do face justice. Um, I I don't would like FIF applied to join this case uh, against Lafarge as a plaintiff. We are still waiting to hear uh, what will happen. Um, I don't think much of it will come forward uh, because the French uh, decision uh, have been very restrictive uh, and it seems very unlikely that anything will come forward uh, for the Yazidis in this case. And Nadia, do you feel the same way? I know that Yazda also made an application to be party to the, the case. Yes, we are, um, I mean, actively supporting, uh, supporting the case mainly, you know, through um, uh, Amal Kuni's office, uh, who is our legal representative and who is representing several survivors in that case. But as Parry mentioned, uh, you know, the, the French jurisdiction seemed uh, quite reluctant. Um, you know, Lafarge has um, a very huge standing in, in France and, you know, they have this, this big law firms working for them when we are just in front of them with you know Amal's uh, team, which is amazing, but you know it's it's still uh, just a few people doing this this you know huge amount of work. Um, and also just to go back to Germany, we are also actively supporting you know the the Jennifer W case, the Taha AJ case, uh, the Taha AJ case being the first you know genocide case against an ISIL member for crimes against Yazidis. And you know these cases are are meant to uh, end you know 
and I mean, very soon. So what we really hope out of these cases is that there will be a domino effect. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear from Jonathan that you know, states, are, states are already showing more and more interest. And, and we really hope that you know, the outcome of, of, the, of these two main cases uh, will, will really have a domino effect. Thank you. And I know that one avenue that also has been explored is around the responsibility of social media uh, companies as well, uh, given as many um, who are, are tuning in know. Uh, ISIS uh, is shockingly, I think, Jonathan, as you said, when we, we reflect on the amount of evidence that's available, um, normally perpetrators try to hide the, the nature of their crimes. ISIS was extremely public in outlining both its ideology and its in, intent, genocidal intent, but also in, uh, in real time, uh, putting out information about specific attacks, uh, areas that it was imminently going to uh, move into, and in trying to use various social media platforms to uh, build support, uh, urge people to um, assist them, and also tragically, in some cases, uh, as Hari uh, mentioned before, actually facilitate the sale of human beings. So there are a lot of, of really important questions that need to be explored on how to uh, advance accountability for those who enable or are complicit in the commission of crimes uh, in, in the social media and private sector as well. I wanted to um, pick up on a, a theme, um, Jonathan, that you had mentioned when you went through that really powerful uh, video and we're talking about some of the, the technological innovations that UNIT had has been been using. Can you kind of talk to us a little bit about how you're harnessing technology for investigations and why it's so important? Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thanks, Naomi. Yeah, absolutely. I think it also connects back to, to your previous comment about, um, you know, the amount of information uh, put out there and, and made available. Um, you know, it, it, I think it, it's actually quite daunting for investigators, the amount of video um, and material published um, uh, and, and other materials um, made available by Islamic Threat Crimes. Of course, you say, as you say, um, far from being trying to hide it, uh, there was an active attempt to, to publicize as, as, as much as possible. Um, um, I think, you know, that, that, that that's where, that's where um, technology for us has been absolutely crucial. We have quite an exciting, I think, initiative at the moment um, in cooperation with Microsoft, um, which, we, which is the, called the Zetio project, um, where we've been able to work with them to actually use artificial intelligence um, to begin to analyze on a mass data level um, the video materials made available by ISIL and also then collected by UNITAD um, in terms of battlefield evidence. Um, and what that uh, technology does in kind of, you know, very short terms is um, we're able to extract from the video files uh, and audio files two key as assets for us. One is we're able to extract, automatically extract facial imagery from, from, from the video. So the uh, artificial intelligence tool can capture the faces and bring them out into, into our facial image database without any uh, individual actions necessarily taken by investigators. But then also in terms of the audio, whether it's audio files or video, uh, automatically transcribe the audio irrespective of whether it's in Arabic or in English or another language or in Russian, um, and then take that into a text format, and then also through machine technology, then translate that immediately into English format. Now, the reason that's so important for us is that rather than scouring through an individual video, trying to listen out for a particular issue or, um, uh, or you know, particular act or person's name, uh, we're able to actually do text-based search. So use our usual um, uh, uh, information search tools to extract that information. So suddenly we're converting now all this information to a much more malleable, much more usable tool. Um, in terms of the image data, in, in terms of the facial images search, it's been extremely successful for us. We now got about, I think, over 220,000 facial images uh, within the database. Um, and when receiving requests from our national authorities, what's been really encouraging is we're now getting hits based on the facial images provided by authorities in uh, different European member states. For example, um, one country that's very open about its cooperation with us is Sweden. Uh, one of the cases where uh, facial images are provided and we found a hit of that, in, of that individual um, showing them in a particular location in Iraq. So I think that's, you know, it's the size of the data and then using the technology in order to extract that. Um, and I think we hope that's going to be a really powerful thing in pushing things forward um, in, the next, uh, in the next few months in our work. You know, it's amazing. It's really a game changer when you think about um, the context in which the museum was born in cases pertaining to the Holocaust, uh, where you know, especially for any cases that were brought outside of Germany, outside of Europe, it was survivors that were seeing their perpetrators 
um, who had sought refuge, be it in Canada or elsewhere. And we have, that's been the model for decades now. Um, and it's also something that I know that uh, Yazidi organizations are, are also engaged in. But the fact that we now have this technological tool um, really enhances the, the likelihood that we might be able to see cases. We just need the actual forums, the jurisdictions to do it, and the, the will and the resources to make those cases happen. But that's really remarkable. Thank you for, for sharing that. Nadia, there were some follow-up questions for you um, around the uh, implementation of the uh, Yazidi survivor law and just kind of what your work with the Iraqi government has been there, but also in regards to the best approaches for the international community, civil society and NGOs to support the newly established um, director general in Iraq's implementation of that 2019 survivor law. If you can share your thoughts and, and reflections on that. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the work we have been doing with uh, Iraq around the, the law, um, you know, started during the um, discussions in the Iraqi parliament. We really, with survivors, provided recommendations on how to improve the law, uh, same with the coalition. And in, in regards to how international community could support the implementation of the law, I think there are several things that uh, the international community could do. Uh, first, to support civil society uh, organizations to be heard by the Council of Ministers so that the bylaws are, you know, adopted as quickly as possible, but also that the text is, is survivor-centered and actually can uh, lead to effective implementation. Um, I think international community can also support by empower, empowering Sarab, who is the head of uh, the, the Directorate uh, for Survivors Affairs, by building her profile, by meeting her and, and inquiring about her needs and what could be the strategy for the next year, but also for the, for the five next years. Um, there's also a huge need of financial support from the international com community, especially for this first year, simply because the, the Yazidi Survivors Law was um, adopted at the same time as the budget uh, you know, of, of, of Iraq was finalized within the Iraqi parliament. So unfortunately, there was nothing that was um, put aside for the directorate. So the directorate currently has no resources uh, to, de to do any effective work. And then one last point, I think, uh, you know, what would be very helpful uh, coming from the international community is to build the capacity of, of the staff that will be hired and that will be working with survivors. Because, you know, even though um, people in Iraq gained a lot of experience in working with survivors in, in these past years, there's still a lot of, you know, capacity building that needs to be done in order to ensure that they deal with survivors in, in, in the best way possible. Thank you so much for that, Nadia. Very briefly, um, so we're, we're coming to an end. Par, when we talk about the needs of survivors, um, we've spoken about women, we've spoken about men, there is a community that's often um, forgotten, and that is children. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the specific challenges that arise when you're, you're documenting crimes involving children. Thank you, Naomi. I think there are a couple of groups that have been definitely forgotten and undocumented, uh, underdocumented. Uh, Yazidi children, they've suffered immensely. The Yazidi children do, that were abducted by ISIS and brainwashed. We have the Yazidi women that have children born from rape. Uh, they need uh, special protection and consideration uh, and if possible resettlement. And we have obviously the Yazidi men, those uh, small numbers who did survive the mass graves that should not be forgotten. So the Yazidi children that suffered extreme psychological pressure forced to become ISIS members, to hate Yazidis, to go for jihad, to abandon their community and their identity. Um, the Yazidi women, uh, like what they suffered and like the children that were born out of the rape, the women suffered horrors and tortures from the Islamic State uh, and they must grapple with extremely complex crisis to care for and abandon, uh, to care for or abandon their own child. Um, and the Yazidi men that survived, uh, and as I mentioned, there are few, they suffer from PTSD, uh, physical wounds, and they require psychological and physical rehabilitation and support to create a livable future. So what they need is the, the children, obviously, they require realistic infrastructure. They need education. They need safety, nurturing, uh, treatment. Um, the women with children born from rape, as I said, uh, a safe location, empowerment without 
judgment and uh, just basic resources uh, such as provided by the survivor's law to achieve uh, stability in their life. And as I said about the male survivors, definitely they need psychological and physical rehabilitation and support to support to create a livable future. And we should not forget one other one, and that is the youth. The Yazidi youth, the suicide rates are rising in our community and especially among the youth. They do not have any hope in the future after seven years being displaced. Um, employment, education, it is also important and our community cannot grasp it. They can't reach it. Maybe just picking up with that to kind of conclude, um, if each of you could share one or two brief thoughts on where do you hope to see progress over the next year, not just starting with you. Sure, thank you, Naomi. Um, I, before that, I, I just would, I, I know that the, the, this webinar will be translated into Arabic. So if, if any one from the Yazidi community will be watching this, and I'm sure there will be many, uh, I would like really sincerely to present my condolences uh, to them uh, and, you know, just reiterate the fact that we are all here and, and this webinar shows that, you know, a lot of people are interested in the topic and a lot of people are working on this uh, on the ground. Um, in, in terms of priorities, uh, when I saw this question, it was actually very hard. Um, there are so many things that, that need to be done, uh, but I think uh, just to repeat what I said, I think we really need to prioritize the implementation of the Yazidi survivors law because it contains many elements, you know, that can cover, you know, a, a large uh, panel of needs that the survivors have in terms of services, uh, you know, monthly salaries. Some survivors are, you know, the only breadwinners in their families. And this is just a lot of pressure for them. And I think criminal accountability also really needs to move forward, especially since UNITAD has, you know, already concluded that, you know, Yazidi suffered genocide in Iraq and since they have been gathering so, so much evidence, it needs to be used somewhere and, and it needs to be in the country, it needs to be used in the country where those crimes took place, where the victims are and where most of the perpetrators are. Um, and, and finally, I would like to, to conclude by saying, uh, and this is something I have been hearing a lot from the Yazidi community, I think that there needs to be a, a clear plan regarding the excavation process of mass graves and kill sites in Sinjar. Because uh, as Jonathan mentioned, so far 24 sites were excavated, but Sinjar remains full of mass graves, including surface graves. So graves, and, and, and Pari mentioned them as well, where the remain, remains lay on the surface and are endangered by floods, fire, human activities, and, and our team went to Sinjar last month documenting 55 sites and you know these 55 sites we had documented them already in the past and, and they're still in, in the same um, situation and it became even even worse. Um, so I think you know just to summarize I would say these would be uh, the main points that um, you know should be prioritized. Thank you Jonathan top message. Yeah I think I think building on Natsu's comments I think you know from 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 evidence to trials, you know, is the is the bottom line. I I think I think you know now um, uh, that that uh, um, the, 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 it is it is there as as as, um, as Nachi and Perry referenced as well. Um, you know, we have now come to a uh, finding and a position in terms of the criminal investigation and the finding of genocide. We have a solid kind of um, structural framework around which um, those types of cases can now be built. Um, building of course, built you know, building also on the efforts of other um, um, national authorities who are developing kind of genocide uh, trials. Um, but uh, as I say, I think the momentum is there. Um, Probably, you know, in the immediate term, more immediate opportunities for trials um, in um, in jurisdictions such as in the EU authorities, where whether, whether there are you know specific investigations, prosecutions are going. But that said, of course, with our UNITAD personally, with our key focus on empowering our counterparts um, uh, within the Iraqi authorities to take that forward, where there is a you know there is a strong will and an engagement. I mean, I can't you know I really should you know take an opportunity here as well to say that the cooperation from you know key parts of Iraqi administration, um, the Iraqi judiciary, for example, has been crucial um, to what we've been doing. Um, just as of course our partnerships with Yazidi community and, and NGOs, and there is a real will uh, on their side as well to move forward and to reflect um, a comprehensive accountability process. Um, 
which reflects the wishes of survivors. So I think evidence to trials, I think it's possible. Um, you would need to get the word out, you know, that the evidence is there now uh, and that, that, you know, the kind of structural issues previously uh, um, f faced um, may not be as insurmountable as, as, as once thought. Uh, and so getting that, that message out and then working with national authorities to get this in trials, um, you know, in partnership with, um, with the Yazidi community. I, I love the evidence to trials. I think that's something we can all take forward in our, our messaging and it's a good little uh, talk, um, top line to share on social media as well. Pari, final word to, to you. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, I would say everyone can go to the Free Yazidi Foundation website. We have the statement of 3 August commemoration. Uh, one of the things is bring back our women and girls. Uh, we want the Sinjar Agreement to be implemented. We want equal opportunities for Yazidis. Uh, we want the Yazidi Survivors Law to be implemented, better conditions for our internally displaced people. And we want justice and accountability. But most and most of all, the first thing I mentioned, why is nobody looking for our women and girls? Every day, I always mention, the here in the US and elsewhere in Europe, you get an Amber Alert as soon as a little child is missing. Why do we get that? Because we think it is important that if a child or someone goes missing, we go and look for them. Why is nobody making an effort to look for those 2,868 women and girls? I don't care when people say like, maybe they are dead or uh, maybe they're too afraid to come back to the Yazidi community. Then make an effort to let these women and girls who are still in captivity to understand that there are organizations like Free Yazidi Foundation that will do anything to ensure that they can resettle elsewhere or come back into the community and have, have a life even if they have a child born from rape. But it's not acceptable just to wash it away and think that, it's, that we're just going to forget them. We need to keep their voice alive. They are suffering. They are living in a hell. Why are we not looking for them? That's what I want. I want in the next coming years that we make a, a effort internationally to go and look for them. They're in Syria, they're in Turkey, they're in Iraq. They are in captivity and they need to be saved and rescued. Thank you so much, Pari. As our conversation draws to a close, I wanna thank our panelists, Jonathan, Pari and Natya. Uh, your organizations are carving a path towards justice for the Yazidi genocide especially want to commend the Yazidi organizations. You had to very swiftly in the aftermath of the genocide, stand yourselves up and undertake work that uh, tragically needed to happen, but there was no clearly defined route for you to take. You learned as you went, and it's truly remarkable to see the contribution that your organizations have been making to advancing the pursuit of justice. I wanna thank all of you for your questions and for joining us today. I wanna to thank our team. Our mandate is to try to do for communities today what was not done for Jews during the Holocaust. We know that there are still survivors today of the Holocaust who are working to see justice. We know that there are perpetrators who are still being uh, held accountable, most recently in Germany. Our commitment is to work with the Yazidi communities and others on the long road ahead. Today, as the Yazidis are in the process of rebuilding, their needs are immense. The Yazidi community needs a safe place to live and raise their families, to find those who are still missing, to bury their dead with dignity in graves of their own and access to education and sustainable livelihood. There's also a need for the recognition of the harm they suffered and the need for justice, which should not be limited simply to the pursuit of criminal accountability. Finally, just as the risks to the Yazidi community were overlooked for too long, today is imperative that we do not fail other communities who are at risk. As the situation in Afghanistan deteriorates, many Yazidi watch in horror, remembering their own suffering. To truly honor those who were killed, we need to ensure that others, including the Hazara minority today in Afghanistan, are not, like the Yazidi, victims of genocide in the future. In the chat function, we provided links to some of the reports concerning ISIL's crimes against the Yazidis, as well as links to UNITAD, the Free Yazidi Foundation, and Yazda's websites. To learn more about our work, please visit the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's website, which has pages specifically dedicated to the Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide and our work on Iraq, and other contemporary cases, including but not limited to Burma, China, South Sudan, and Syria. The recording of today's panel will be placed on the center's YouTube channel shortly, and it'll be updated with recordings in both English and Arabic subtitles. Thank you again for joining us today. 
please email any questions or comments to the Simon Scott Center at genocideprevention at ushmm.org. And may we hopefully in one year be holding discussions about the cases that have been held over the past year, the implementation of the Yazidi Survivor Law, and hopefully other avenues to justice that have been advanced. Thank you.